Welcome to One Shots, a condensed version of our normal show where instead of two or three of us are talking about a movie we've recently saw, it's just one of us. My name is Vox, and today I'll be giving my thoughts, feelings, and a review of 2019's movie, The Assistant. Before you start to comment, but Vox, the movie didn't come out until 2020. Let's get your facts straight, boy. Or girl. The Assistant had its world premiere at Telluride Music Festival, and I hope I'm saying that right, on August 30th in 2019. But it wasn't released to the public until January 31st of 2020. It's hard to think that a film that is set in one day, based around only one character, and didn't have a whole lot of cast put into it, could tell such a good story and have such an impact. But for a film that was set in just one day pretty much one character in an office, and only had an 88-minute runtime. Man, did it pack a punch. The film stars Julia Garner, known for her role in Ozark, playing one of my favorite characters from the show, as the main character that we follow for the next 88 minutes. From the get-go, the movie is dark, dingy, and cold, and it starts to amp the anxiety for me as every minute went by. There are carefully placed details in the opening scene of the movie that help kind of foreshadow the rest of the story without completely handing it to you. It was refreshing for me to watch, actually, and it allowed me to start putting a lot of the pieces together and making my own assumptions on what was happening or what was going to happen, and I didn't feel spoon-fed through the entire thing. On top of that, they do help you out in the second half of the movie as they start laying out the pieces in front of you and putting them together. So, spoiler alert from here on out. When we see Jane picking up the jewelry and cleaning the couch in the beginning, you can tell that there's something dirty going on, literally. Especially since the boss's wife calls shortly after that scene, screaming about issues that she's having with her credit cards. Then later in the movie, we hear her screaming about how he's not around and she's not able to talk to him. These scenes go hand in hand later in the film as we start to see a young lady come and pick up the jewelry that she left. And the co-workers even mentioning for a brief moment in a late scene saying, never sit on the couch. Another small amount of detail that I really appreciated was the fact that we see Jane biting her fingers. Then later, we see that same finger that she was biting wrapped in a band-aid. This is clearly showing that she has some sort of coping mechanism for her stress and anxiety, all while being aware of it at the same time and trying to resolve it, a theme that flows through the rest of the movie consistently. The conversation that Jane is having with her mother is a direct reflection on how someone, especially myself, in their mid and late 20s, in the year 2020 or 2021 at this point, trying to figure themselves out in life. She's busy, she's tired, she's stressed, and she even forgets her father's birthday. Something that I've done personally in my life several times, especially when I was in college and just trying to get into my internships and my jobs before I was stable. Sorry, Mom. We even get another callback to the fact when she is talking to the company's lawyer, I'm assuming lawyer at least, it's not really completely laid out, but she mentions that she's going through a lot, and he even mentions that she probably hasn't seen her friends or family in a while, which is another cause of stress in her life. Speaking of the lawyer, this is kind of the scene where the movie climaxes. And not to jump too far ahead, but if you're that interested, you should probably go watch it yourself. Jane has had enough and wants to bring light to the issues that she's seeing and the issues that she wants attention brought to. From the drugs that she restocks to the needles that she throws away to the trash that she picks up around the office, even to the women that are coming and going for interviews, one of which has no experience in acting. And we find out eventually, kind of through subtle gestures and and laid out in front of you, kind of this is what's happening moments, we find out that this company that she's working for is involved in the casting or production in the movie industry of some sort. She mentions to the lawyer that she wants to be a producer. So that's where the puzzle pieces start coming together. She tries to say in very subtle terms, but doesn't get it out, that there's an abuse of power and position happening. And what we know by this point is the boss is taking advantage of that power and using it on the women that are coming in for interviews. It gave me, and will give the viewer, just enough to put the rest of the puzzles together. And you're also hoping, at least I was, for the downfall of the boss. Production-wise, other than the previously mentioned details of the character, there is a heavy use of sound throughout the whole movie. When you're not listening fully, you're going to miss something. And when you're turning your head just a little bit towards the TV to hear what's happening, 
Something loud in the background is swallowing up all the details that you wanted to hear. This effect continually raises the amount of anxiety and the eerie overtones that this entire movie is blackened with. On top of all that, the boss's present is the most crushing and crippling source of the feeling that this movie comes from, and he is doing that all while being non-existent. He lingers in the shadows, quite literally, and is never seen on screen. And I mentioned shadows being literal because we only see him for a, just a hair of a second when his arm can be seen in his office through an open door wall behind Jane's character. This is the best detail of them all. I could probably talk a bit more about this movie and go into a little bit more detail on what actually happens throughout it all, like the paper throwing of the two co-workers to get her attention, or the fact that she goes to another co-worker who is clearly fed up with her and the boss's shit, but it's not needed. The whole movie was really well done as a whole. I'm always amazed when a movie can pull off what they did in this movie with such a little cast and such few locations and get that feeling and that message across. It kind of reminds me of a silent film in a way, using the surroundings and the very detailed shots to tell the story more than the dialogue it does itself. A few more examples just to throw them out there is there's a printer that's constantly pumping out scripts or schedules or photos of people that are coming in for interviews or for work to show the amount of work that is actually happening in this office. Personal shots of Jane with flushed cheeks, hands on her foreheads or temples rubbing them, clearly having a headache, or tear-filled eyes after making a mistake and getting yelled at by the boss. Those details will explain everything just by using a sheer emotion. The film was released at a pretty good time as well, if you want my opinion, highlighting the cases of abuse just as the Me Too movement was in full swing and the Weinstein case was blasted out on front page news. This allows the viewer to understand and sympathize with just how raw and serious these situations can be. It doesn't just affect a single person that's being abused. It's a ripple effect that covers the entire sea of people that are involved with that single person. So on this show, we do a, a, a different rating system where we say pick or flick, yes or no. We also give it a 1 out of 10, just so you can align it just a little bit better. Sometimes you can have a really good movie, and it's really well done, and it gets an 8 on the scale. But we say flick it because you don't get anything really out of it. Or vice versa. Maybe the movie's complete garbage on the production end, but the story's fantastic. So we say pick it. It's worth a watch. So for this movie, I'm giving it an 8 out of 10. An absolute pick. A must watch. If you like what you're hearing on the show, please give us a like. Give us a comment. Give us a subscribe. We want to hear from you. I want to hear from you. If you have a movie that you think I should watch, Natasha should watch, Luke should watch, to do a one-shot on, to hear our thoughts on it, let us know. Or maybe you have one that you want us all to sit down and have a conversation on. We do want to hear it. If you've been consistently listening, this is one shot number three. And the reason I'm doing it is to help balance the content that we have, either not enough or just an extra bit. You can find Luke over at Confused Reviews on YouTube. Make sure you give him a subscribe and check him out. He does his reviews a little bit differently than we do. It's not a podcast, it's a video where he lays out the entire movie and script and crack some jokes as it as well, which is also the reason why this is the new portion of this channel, so that when he's busy crunching out the final hours of his reviews, you can still listen to him or me or Natasha doing a one-shot or go back and listen to some of our full shows just to get you by. Thank you so much for listening. This is Pick It and Flick It Podcast, one-shots number three, The Assistant. We'll see you next time.